There's no such thing as anything that starts without apologies. So um, I'm used to talking to 20 year olds or seniors in retirement centers. Um, I, this is refreshing, you're what I call a normal age. Um, I'm used to shouting to 50 people at a time with no microphone, so we'll see how this works in like a real professional setting. Um, also, I didn't realize my bio said that I designed the RISD tote bag with Nick Benson in the room. Because his grandfather's beautiful RISD seal, which is hand-drawn and an exquisite piece of lettering, has been completely bastardized, cut through ruby lift by hand by someone in Vermont that I had no control over, and printed going off the side of a bag. Um, and if he wants to hurt me afterwards for what that did to that logo, it would not be unacceptable. Um, it, there was a set of circumstances, there were some problems we were solving at the time. Um, <laughs> I have three titles. Also, I, got, I did the assignment wrong. I'm sorry. Um, the dog didn't eat my homework. I just disregarded the assignment. I was supposed to talk about my design work uh, in relationship to Rhode Island, and I couldn't think of anything. And what came to mind was, oh, there's that Instagram post that Nick Benson posted that took up two days of my life researching. I should talk about how I do research. So I'm not actually talking about my work. I'm talking about uh, some techniques I've developed for researching for understanding design history better. Um, so my real title is How to Learn Cool Stuff from Instagram. My alternate title is if uh, I will implode if one more student tells me I can't give my presentation in class today because it turns out there isn't really any information about the topic. Um, uh, and my third title, which is just for Will Reeves who's in the audience, is Who the Heck Was Gene Reinecke? Uh, and this, uh, watch this on YouTube, it's one of the most disturbing ads ever. It's a Scotty the Scotch Tape Man sledding through penguins. Oh, we don't want it. It's all right. It's, you know, not working. Yeah, it doesn't matter. No, we don't want it. Uh, we, we wanted it in the background while I was talking so that I wouldn't have to say anything meaningful, uh, but we don't want it on its own. Uh, okay, so uh, I teach design history at RISD. And there's this collision, we're at a collision moment where we've never had easier access to information with the internet and digital resources. And we've never had less skill at using information to do anything meaningful. And it's, it's blowing my mind because if I had these tools when I was 20, I could have changed the world. And I have these tools when I'm 50 and forget it, I'm tired. Um, so, <laughs> uh, in design history, there's this problem that we have tools to teach it, called the canon. There's objects in museums and in textbooks that we can use to tell the story of you know, our innovation and the history of what we figured out and how we made it and what we did, and it's a good story. Like, I'd love to talk about how Grom Design figured out how to add metal and plastic in a meaningful way, um, but it's a story that's really based on dead white guys with shit in the MoMA. I, I can curse because someone else already cursed earlier. Um, and I mean, so it's like a good story, but it leaves out a lot of people. Uh, and this is what I'm stuck with when I'm teaching an incredibly diverse group of 20 year olds who have an expectation that I represent the world they know to them historically. And you can't. You can use what we know about from history to talk about it. So it's, it's a great story, but it's limited. And what a lot of my colleagues have been doing over the last 20, 30 years is expanding the canon. And this is a movement I'm sort of part of to look at, well, there's all these women who are designing, let's talk about them more, and that will balance things. There's all these people designing globally around the world, let's talk about them more. But I still feel like that's artificial. That's saying this broken situation where we're using old things we happen to have paid attention to uh, puts a, an, unheavy, a, an unfair burden on some things, and it doesn't really tell the story well. So I do a lot of that. I'll, I'll talk about Charlotte Perry until you're tired of listening to me because it's so exciting. But the reality is when I'm talking about design, it's the objects that we use every day that matter, right? It's the things that solve all of our problems, big or small, in our day-to-day. -day. You know, I've, and I've learned more from M&Ms than I ever have from an Eames chair, um, and vice versa. But we can't really talk about that stuff because it hasn't been researched, it hasn't been written about, there aren't books, it's not in museums. The stuff that deodorant bottle was the very first blow molded plastic piece of packaging. It changed the world. It made deodorant available to everyone. Uh, but you can't teach that in a history class. You can watch the ad on YouTube. Uh, so as a result, when I, when I have students who come in and say, oh, well, I couldn't do any research because I Googled it once and nothing came up, I'm just astounded because I feel like, well, Google it a second time or find a back door that isn't Google. 
So I want to talk about how I'm working not to expand the canon. I'm doing that a little bit, but mostly I'm just trying to ignore it and find a, a different way to tell the story. Um, and this collides with tonight in a really fun way. So I decided my talk tonight would really just be um, Nick Benson's cool, let's talk about him more. Um, and on July 10th, on Instagram, um, I saw this post that he put up on Instagram. And he posted it to say like, no, no, I'm not OCD. I just lined everything up in perfect rows. But I didn't even notice the text because I was so distracted by the background. What is that tape dispenser? Like, now you know why I don't have a lot of friends. Um, <laughs> tape dispenser. Everyone knows that tape dispenser. It is an iconic, important object in American design history. It's like, it sums up everything about 19, I don't know, 37, 38. It's streamlined, it's cast iron, it's tipping into the future, but performing in a, in a sort of historical way. It's introducing a new, a new object to our lives. Uh, it, it's doing so many things that we want canonical design history objects to do, and yet, who designed it? It's not in the MoMA, it's not in any book I've ever seen. I don't know anything about it. I just knew that I lost interest in uh, tape measures, pencil sharpeners, and lettering, and was totally fixated on that. So this was like at 10 o'clock in the morning when I had a lot to do that day, and it, did, it derailed my whole day. Um, eBay, eBay is user created. The descriptions on eBay are language based so that you understand what I'm selling and buy it. They're great descriptions. When you do a Google search, you're stuck with analytics that, I don't know, programming wonks have come up with. If you type in whatever your brain thinks in eBay, someone else thought the same language use. So I just typed in vintage deco metal tape dispenser. That's how I would describe it. And look how long it took me to find it, right? There it is. So I also learned a lot from this. I learned that it has a cute nickname. It's called the whale tail. Uh, I learned that it's in uh, two sizes, a three inch or a one inch, it comes in multiple colors, it's cast iron. I, I mean, people tell you how much it weighs, how long it is. By seeing what is wrong with the thing they're trying to sell, you understand where the design failed. So you can really learn a lot about design through eBay descriptions, like, which is true. I don't have to be apologetic. Also, there are people more serious about selling by using better photography. And there's some amazing product photography on eBay if you cut out the bedroom in the background, or the coffee cup. So all my slides have back, black backgrounds and they took hours to produce. Um, but this was a particularly beautiful photograph of this tape dispenser that allowed me to zoom in on the label. And what do you see on that label but patent identification? Two patent numbers. There's a utility patent and a design patent. I, there's 800 things we could talk about with this. Like, it's also the 3M company. What's the 3M company? Scotch tape, why scotch? So many layers of questions firing in all of our brains. But we're just gonna skip right to the patent. So then I looked up the patents, and the first utility patent is from 1936. So this isn't what it looked like, this is how it works. That already existed a couple of years before, and it's a heavy base so that you can pull against it. Some of the older people in the room will remember how it used to be easy to use tape because the tape dispenser had weight. Um, a lightweight side with a groove for the tape to slide into and fingers to rip the tape, pretty basic. Uh, and that's the, the, every tape dispenser since has referenced this patent. But the design patent's a little more interesting because that's actually what it looks like. There it is. So in, you know, maybe four minutes from Instagram revelation to uh, problem solved, I learned that it was designed in, in uh, it was patented in 1941 by Gene Otis Reinecke. And then I thought, well, that's weird because the tape dispenser's so ubiquitous. Everybody knows it. Most people have had one. Um, you'll see one everywhere you go from tonight on, and I'm sorry. But I never heard of Gene Otis Reinecke. So I Googled him and he existed. He was a, he's got a one sentence biography on the Industrial Design Society of America website database. But it, that doesn't really tell you anything about him. So I went back to the patents because the amazing thing about Google patents is it's all cross-referenced. And it launched just a few years ago with American patents and every year more and more countries are getting their patents digitally scanned optically scanned and posted. So what's great is it's all cross-referenced. So I could click on Gene Ernest Reideke's name from this tape dispenser patent, and suddenly an entire career is brought to life. Right? Like, why don't we know Gene Otis Reideke? Look what he did. And what have I ever done? So uh, this was really exciting to me, because a couple of these things are actually very famous objects also. 
And I mean, so I'm, honestly, like I'm 10 minutes out from the Instagram revelation at this point. Um, <laughs> it turns out he designed every Scotch tape dispenser from the very beginning. So Scotch tape was invented in the 1920s when cellulose was first made as a sheet, and they realized you could put something sticky on it and fix your problems. Um, but for over a decade, it just came in a roll. I don't know what you were supposed to do with it. You just, I mean, the frustration of that, you know? So this was the first uh, stamp metal tape dispenser. It was inexpensive enough to manufacture that it could come with the tape. He also, in 1939, designed an even more iconic plastic one. And I'm really intrigued by plastic design from this era because it was patented in 1939 and it didn't actually get made until the 50s because World War II happened. There are a lot of plastic designs that were figured out in the 30s, but just sat in warehouses waiting for plastic to become available. Uh, and what's, so, so that's why I don't have a 1939 tape dispenser to show you a picture of. I, eBay only gave me one from the 50s. Uh, but every decade revisited this tape dispenser and we still have our own version of it. It was originally two halves that snapped apart so you could replace the tape because we cared about resources. Now you throw them away because we like the Pacific Garbage Patch, I guess. Um, and I was really intrigued that if you follow just his tape dispenser trail, every decade he's updating his aesthetic, the materials, the ideas about tape. This one has an arm you press and it meters out three inches of tape, so it's for like a high-use tape environment. Uh, and then look, who owns this tape dispenser, right? You never thought about, did someone design that? I wonder who. Jean Otis Reinecke designed the Decor tape dispenser in 1959. Uh, it's changed over the years, and it's got, uh, of course now it's 2017, it has to have rounded corners. Um, but it is a really spectacular piece of industrial design. And uh, th there are, I, I have always said that the, the, the judge of a, of a good designer is how many people's lives have been affected by their work. Uh, for me, that, that matters. That's why I'm, not, I'm less interested in craft, I'm less interested in art. Um, because I just feel like, whoa, tape dispensers, everybody needs those. Um, this design has changed more lives than, than, than you know, anything I'll ever make, than any RISD tote bag. Uh, so then there's all these other digital tools that I'm leaving out, like you could go to Pinterest, you could go to Flickr, you could go to anywhere. The problem with them is they're not about accuracy. Like Pinterest is for my exciting ideas about wedding decor. Uh, but if you already know with authority this is the patent and this is the image, you can find amazing photographs of that thing on Pinterest. Forget about the description that's wrong. Use the, the patent that you know is true. Uh, but I, just for the purposes of keeping this short, here's another layer of information that's interesting. You can go to eBay and find ads. So then I just look for a vintage Scotch tape ad and I found a whole other treasure trove. I put this in for Christine, because this is like graphic design history now. Uh, when you see the object in print, you learn what the problems were the designer was trying to solve. I just see an old tape dispenser and it's cool old. When you look at how the ad is explaining what you do with tape, you can fix your hammer handle. You can, I mean, the text is hilarious. Um, but as a historian, you can reverse engineer what did the world need, what did designers make to, solve, to address that need, and then how did they teach the public about that object before they owned it? We can't think about that stuff when looking in the rear view mirror. Also, just from a technical standpoint, this is color lithography. There are three color ads to keep costs down. Photography was not really printable with the printing techniques we had at the time. So it uses photography, but if, you're, if you look carefully, the tape dispensers are rendering. The scotch tape has been highlighted with lots of white so it shows up against the bad printing. The images are a crazy collage of mom's hand and kids' Christmas presents. It's using every intentional design technique to make that thing printable so that it, it explains what it is to people. Uh, and I saw the ads aging from, we have to explain why you need scotch tape to sell it to you, and that they're crazy. You can tape your doll together. Um, and then when World War II, when World War II came, that had been so effective that we were scolded. So this woman's fixing her umbrella with scotch tape. And the ad is saying, don't fix your umbrella. We need that tape to seal boxes of plasma to mail uh, to the soldiers for blood transfusions. I mean, it's, you can learn a lot about the world from ads. Um, and then I was intrigued that the ads aged as well out of explaining what tape was into some other territory like get a better hairdo or um, you know, get closer to a spaceman. I know. It didn't, it didn't work. I, 
I didn't try it, but I then Googled, I Googled people who have had their hair, their bangs cut with scotch tape. That was fun. Um, and then I'm, I was really intrigued that by the 60s when the decor style came out, suddenly we don't need to be told what it is, we don't need to be told what it costs, we don't need to be told, now we care about the form, the color, the shape. How do you design objects that support the lifestyle we have once an object isn't new? Uh, so I actually love this ad that's just, all it's saying is it's a shape and a color. I mean, can you imagine what a luxury to be able to only say that and still sell something? Uh, hmm? It's called an iPhone. Yeah, it's called an iPhone. It's white. <laughs> and it's a rectangle. Um, so uh, I, you could do it with any of these patents. I was stuck in tape dispenser land. But then, um, for Will Reeves, I thought, wait, I know that drill press. Uh, that drill press is a Delta, uh, and it's a famous drill press housing that everyone who's ever used a drill press has encountered. Uh, and it made me appreciate that it looks like a mask or a face. Uh, he did the health meter Continental Scale, on which some of us have been frustrated uh, repeatedly in our lives. <laughs> uh, and I mean, it's just endless. He did uh, Zenith Television, health meter Scale, Crazy Bird, clothes pins, and a toaster that is one of the most famous toaster designs because toasters were the thing that taught us to do deep draws in metal stamping. First toasters were flat sheet metal, then they were sort of formed, then Gene Reinecke said, wait a minute, we could do a stamping and use it twice on the, use it, the same stamping twice and put a seam around it. And then a good decade later, we figured out after World War II how to do one stamping and make it one piece. So it's a famous toaster, but whoever heard of his name? And then this weird um, voice in the back of my head said, you've seen this before, you just forgot. Edward Kaufman Jr. was design director at the moment. He was industrial design director there, and he was a total snob in the 50s, and he did a whole series of shows called Good Design. And if you didn't get something in the Good Design show, you were not a good designer. And uh, he also wrote a book called What is Modern Design, in which he says, streamlining is good for airplanes, they go fast. Streamlining is bad for tape dispensers. And he says, it is, uh, streamlining is naively echoed on the scotch tape dispenser. And so I went, I worked so hard to find this damn image for you, because um, I knew it existed, but I couldn't find it. And then when I found it, I was really disappointed, because I thought, well, that's not actually the tape dispenser. The stripes go the wrong way, right? But it tells you a lot about Edward Kaufman Jr., who just remembered, oh, that thing is streamlined and has stripes on it. Um, and they put the stripes the wrong way. And all they're doing is being speed movement on something that's cast iron and doesn't move. In fact, uh, they go vertically, and they give your brain an indication of where to put the tape in, and they give your hand purchase when you pick it up. So they do stuff. They don't just decorate. And in his, uh, the title of the next section is called Streamlining is Not Good Design. So poor Gene Reinecke, right? Like this tape dispenser was in every home in America. We're not gonna bother remembering his name. We're gonna tell him he's bad. Um, in fact, he then, Kaufman goes on to have 12 tenets of good design, which are like, it has to be affordable, it has to be well-made, it has to be durable. They are all satisfied by this tape dispenser from where I stand. Um, so I hate this tape, this pencil sharpener on the left more than I can possibly communicate to you. It is one of the most famous objects in the history of industrial design. It was designed by Raymond Lowy in 1934. It's a prototype, it was never put in production. You have to bolt it to the table. So as a streamlined object, it references speed. That's a little confusing. Um, it's sold, there's a per, one prototype. It's sold in 2004 for $100,000 because it's so important. It's in every book on industrial design. It's on the cover of many books on industrial design. It's pretty, I don't mind it. Um, it's just doing what it does wrong. Um, Gene Reinke's tape dispenser is available on eBay for $12. And I think it's a much more honest interpretation of what design can do in our world and what manufacturing can do to improve that. So for me, as a design historian, my students think there's no way to find information because I couldn't find a book that tells me about that pencil sharpener, when in fact what I would love is for everyone to be learning about tape dispensers. Um, it's a sort of a broken landscape, but I feel like we're at a hinging point where we're gonna eventually, oh, I can't believe I'm saying this, we're going to give up on books. We're not. You still have to go to archives and do research. But the promise of books is the, the editing, the years it takes to make them, the, the, the correctness of the information in them. The internet sucks at that, right? Everything on the internet is wrong. Um, but we're at a point where we can use these things in concert. And we can finally say, instead of only talking about a handful of objects that tell our story in the wrong way, like we could talk about a brown coffee maker that costs $500 when new, 
Or we could talk about the $9 knockoff that Mr. Coffee made that everyone bought instead. Um, so I would love to be able to shift the conversation so we understand the expensive things as expensive things. But we understand that there were other people out there doing the utilitarian objects that we use and we could actually use that to teach about design. Um, and just to circle back to the real point of this talk, uh, which is that Nick Benson is a better Instagrammer than you. Um, I, I, I mean, it co-opted like two hours of my day, but I posted an immediate response. Uh, Look at this! Your tape dispenser was designed by like the, the father of all tape dispensers, Gene Otis Reinecke, whom I've never heard of and I'm now madly in love with. And like 34 seconds later, he posted another one-upmanship of, oh, yeah, I have that one too. So uh, that's the... <laughs> That's the Benson shop, complete spectrum of tape dispensers. So there you have it. Um, that's what I brought for you. Thank you. Woo!